Matthew 13, I want to look at verse 24. When you get it, say, I've got it. If you don't have it, say, hold on. You shouldn't be saying that. You ought to know where Matthew 13 is. Starting at verse 24, reading from the King James Version, you will find the word of God reads on this wise. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, but while men slept, but while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. An enemy hath done this. An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that, thou, that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay. Lest while you gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Here it is. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. Thus ends the reading of the word of God. The grass withered, the flower faded. But the word of our God shall stand. If you don't mind, smile at your neighbor. Show them all two or 32, whatever your case may be. And say, neighbor, tonight's sermon subject, something has gone wrong in the field. And it happened while we were sleeping. Look at somebody else and say, neighbor, something has gone wrong in the field. And it happened while we were sleeping. You may be seated in the presence of God. Let's pray. God of grace and God of mercy, bless your name tonight. We bless your name. God, how we thank you for your grace and your mercy. Now, God, we've come to the preaching hour. And, Lord, I readily confess that I'm not qualified to stand here right now. But God, rescue me from me. Use me for your glory. To the end that you may be glorified, the saint may be strengthened, and the sinner may be saved. It's in the precious name of Jesus Christ we pray with thanksgiving and anticipation. And all of God's people said, amen. amen. Washington Irving, at the turn of the American Revolutionary War, before and after, was the author of a very interesting, very familiar story, the story of Rip Van Winkle. Uh, Rip Van Winkle was a Dutch villager who lived at the mountains of, at the base of the mountains of New York Catskill Mountain. Rip Van Winkle was a good guy, but he was a bit lazy as it relates to his farm and his home. He was loved by everyone except for his wife. And one day, Rip, in an effort to get away from his wife, decided to climb the mountain. And as he got halfway through the mountain, he came in contact with some strange men that were wearing some strange clothes. And he drank some of their strange liquor. And Rip Van Winkle fell to sleep under a shade tree for 20 years. 20 years after he wakes up, he discovers that the world is no longer the world that he once knew. And as he makes his way down that mountain, when he gets to the base of that mountain, there was an inn on the Hudson Bay that when he went up that mountain, there was a picture of King George III. But by the time the 20 years had passed, and by the time he got down, there was a picture of George Washington. His wife had died and all of his friends had been killed in the Revolutionary War, Rip Van Winkle discovered that the world was no longer the world that he once knew. 
As a matter of fact, he recognized that something had changed in the world. People had not the same morals and principles. Their principles, practices, and their perspective of God had changed. They were not people that believed in God the way they once believed in God. Things had happened in the world, and Rip recognized that it happened while he was sleeping. He discovered that something had gone terribly world wrong in the world, and it happened while he was sleeping. It's not indeed too far removed to suggest that even 20 years ago, what we see today, that much has changed in the world. There's not the same morals or perspective as it relates to even when I was a child, but things have changed. Where did it become normal for men to marry men and women to marry women? It's a new normal in the world. And even after 65 years after the civil rights movement, things have changed. As a matter of fact, you could help me preach this. Look at your neighbor and say, things have changed. That's the wrong neighbor. Look at another neighbor and say, things have changed. Black people are not as morally conscious as they once was 65 years ago. Four college students go into a Woolworth and sit down at a counter and demand to be served because black folk were conscious. They were conscious of, of their rights. They, were, they had a righteous reaction. 1968 in the U.S. Olympics, it was John Carlos and Tommy Smith that raised their black fist with black gloves to say I'm black and I'm proud. But now we are no longer raising our black fist for black pride, but our pants are sagging for black shame. I need some help in here that can recognize that we've lost our way and something has happened in the world and it happened. God help your boy. While we were sleeping, there's no longer respect for our sisters like there was. You tell me how an R&B singer for 30 years can rape and pillage and pedophile young black women. You mean to tell me, folk, I just realized it now. What happened for the last 30 years? Something has gone wrong in the world. The world does not have the respect for the church or the preacher like it used to have. Something is going wrong in the world. As a matter of fact, help me preach this. Look at your neighbor and say, it happened while we were sleeping. Matthew 13. Let me get to the text because that pie is calling me. It keeps calling me. Matthew 13. Jesus has changed his style of preaching. He is no longer teaching in his normal lifestyle manner because the Pharisees have declared that he has power of evil. And so Jesus begins to speak in parables. As a matter of fact, Matthew 13 is considered the beginning of parables, and he spoke in parables for three reasons. Number one, to reveal, first of all, the mysteries of the kingdom. Then number two, that those that were not saved would not know what he was talking about. Number three, that he might fulfill scripture. For Isaiah said, Isaiah 69, 1 through 6, that there would come a time, 6, come 9 through 10, that there would come a time when people would listen and still not understand what the, I'm looking at some folk right now, you've been looking at me all night long, still don't understand what, just nod your head if you understand what I'm talking about, because we're living in a time and day where I could be talking and you still don't understand what I'm saying, but listen, if you listen to the words of this, of this text, Jesus is giving a parable. In Matthew 13, there are two parables. The first parable deals with what we hear, but the second parable deals with what we see. And in the second parable, he places it in terms that these hillbilly Galileans could understand exactly what he was talking about. So he used an agricultural term to make put the hay where the horse can get it. And he tells them in verse 24 that a farmer, has good seed and he gives it to his hired servants and he gives it to his hired servant that they might plant good seed and he wants good seed because he's expecting a great bumper crop 
And so he gives his workers the seed because that's all that the farmer has is good seed. And they go out and they plant the seed. But that night, after they had planted good seed, the text says that an enemy crept in. And among those good seeds, he sows bad seeds. And over a period of time, the workers observe something. They notice that something had gone wrong in the field because they knew that they planted good seed. But as they begin to look at that growth, they notice that some weeds. See, I said weed this morning. My church, everybody woke up. Some tares were growing alone with the wheat. And they go to the farm and says, did not we sow good seed? Farmer said, that's all I got. All I got is good seed. Then they asked, then why then have these tares grow, grown up with the wheat? And the farmer's response was, an enemy had done this. As a matter of fact, help me preach. Look at somebody and say, the enemy has done this. And, and so the worker said, well, then can we just go and just pull the tares and the wheat or the tares so that the wheat? Farmer says, no, no. Let the wheat and the tare grow together. Let the backbiter and the blessed grow together. Let the grumbler and let the gracious grow together. Let the hater and let the holy grow together. I stopped by tonight on my way to heaven because heaven is my goal. You've got to let God learn how to handle your disappointments in life because God is able to deal with it all by himself. There's some lessons in this text. Let me give them to you and I'll sit down and shout my own self happy. The first text that we learned in this text because the text is loaded with symbolism. Can I teach this for a few minutes? The farmer is God. The seed is what's been sown in our heart. The workers are God's true workers in his vineyard. The enemy is the devil. The reapers are the angels. The fire represents hell. But the barnyard represents heaven. And I need some folk in here that have some hope for the barnyard tonight. That know that you don't want to go to the fire, but that your eyes are fixed on the barnyard. This text teaches us that there are times when even God's people get spiritually asleep. Over the course of the last 2,000 years, systematic theology has changed. And has it, has it changed because God's word has changed? Has not changed because God's word has changed. It's because the church has not been a good steward over handling the precepts, the practices, and principles that God has laid out to us. The question tonight is, how did this happen? An enemy has done this. An enemy has done this. Enemy has crept in. He has made his way into the church and now the church has lowered its standard. When the church is supposed to raise the moral bar for the world, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Tell somebody, wake up. Tell your other neighbor, wake up. Here's a second lesson in this text. I'm almost finished. I will keep smelling that pie. I'm almost going to a runaway. The second lesson in this text is that those of us who work for the Lord ought to be able to notice when something has gone wrong. 
That's what happens in the text. These workers sold these seeds. And over a period of time, they realize that something is gone wrong in the field. I'm talking to somebody in here tonight that ought to realize when the devil has crept into a situation, the Lord allow you to feel something ain't right. The Spirit will allow you to discern there's something about this situation that's not right. The only way you don't notice something is right is when you don't work for the Lord. I'm almost done. Tell somebody I'm working for the Lord. Tell somebody else I'm working for the Lord. This text teaches us finally that God has the final say. That's how the text closes. Shall we pull up the tab and the wheat? God says, let them grow together. But at the last day, at the harvest, I'll send my reapers. They'll take those tares, throw them into the fire. I'm almost done. They take those wheat. And we'll put that wheat into a barnyard. I'm preaching this tonight because an enemy has done this. What's happening in Washington, what's happening in our churches, what's happening in our government, what's happening in our school system, an enemy has done this and it's happened while the church has been sleeping. Here's my three points and I'm out of here. Here's the question How do we live as Christians in 2019 when culture is pressing upon us, when we're receiving peer pressure about changing what we truly believe, when those of us that claim that the tomb in Jerusalem is empty and now folk are trying to tell you that Jesus ain't the only way. When these new age luminaries come with all type of shenanigans on how church should be, when we know that we ought to stand in the old way, the first thing I want to tell you is watch and pray. I'm in the text. Watch and pray. These workers that were in the vineyard, the only way they noticed something was wrong is that they were watching the field. And when they noticed that something was wrong, they went and told the master about it. I want to suggest the first thing you want to remember is watch everybody and watch yourself. As a matter of fact, tell somebody, watch everybody and watch yourself. The devil is sneaky. The devil is is subtle. And listen, before you really judge our Kelly, we all got some sin in here. All of our sin just ain't been exposed. Come on and help me out. I'm I'm looking for somebody in here that can testify. I haven't always been in church on a Sunday night, but by the grace of God, come on and help me out. He's brought me a long way. And if we're honest tonight, we ought to thank God for the sins that other folk don't know about you because we serve a God that's gracious to cover our sins. Tell somebody, watch and pray. If we're going to live in this world, in a Christian world, in a Christian manner, in 2019, even in our churches, you don't pull the weeds. I know you may want to. I know that there are some folk in this world. I know there's some folk in your church that can work your last black nerve. But you've got to let the Lord handle them. You got to let the Lord deal with them. Can I tell you tonight that the Lord can handle your enemy better than you can? Fret not thyself because of evildoers. Neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. God can prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemy. Hey! Don't pull the weeds. I'm done when I tell you, let your light shine. Don't just be the church on Sunday morning, but be the church after the benediction. Be a Christian on your job. Dr. Martin Luther King said that darkness does not drive out darkness, but it's light that drives out darkness. I'm going to let my little light shine. Got to let it shine all on my job. 
got to let it shine all in your home. When you leave here tonight, don't be ashamed to let your little light shine. Tell somebody you've got to wake up and let your little light shine. I thank God tonight for my little light because Jesus gave it to me. And I decided that I'm going to let my little light shine. And it has to shine uh, not just uh, on uh, Sunday morning, but it's got to shine uh, all uh, through the course of the week. And I'm looking for somebody tonight that don't mind uh, testifying. Uh, I don't mind uh, letting my little light shine. Do me this favor tonight, uh, and I'm in my seat. Uh, just ease your hand uh, in your neighbor's hand. Uh, and say, neighbor, oh, neighbor, say, neighbor, I know a man that's from Galilee. When I was in trouble, he set me free. Son of David, seed of Abraham, stone you out of the mountain, meek and humble lamb. Is there anybody in here that don't mind testifying um, that I'm going to stand uh, on the word of God? And the reason I'm standing on the word is because living he loved me, uh, dying he saved me, uh, buried he took my, my sins far away. But that's not how the story ends. Uh, can I go higher? Is that? Anybody here that don't mind waving your hands and say it was early Sunday morning, he got up from the grave and he had all power in his hands. Is there anybody in here that knows he has all power to change the world? Ain't he all right? Ain't he all right? Won't he make a way out of no way? Say yeah!